This webinar is being live streamed, but it's not uh, recorded yet. So we have to wait for that. All done. Hey, everybody. This is Ron Halbert. Tonight, you are here at Friday Night Live here in uh, January 28th of 2022. We have a special, special program for you tonight, which is going out all over the world. So we're excited about that. So let me introduce my co-host to uh, put this all together. Uh, Lynn Nakamoto, St. Petersburg, Florida. Come on down, Lynn. Thank you, co-host Ron. Thanks for all you do. So today we got a special presentation and we have engineer Mike Ojantambia, who's gonna share the mic with me to present data centers. And we are honored to have Oliver Fonte, who is an IT specialist. So he will be able to answer any of our questions related to data centers as well. So we're grateful to have Oliver here with us. So as we present tonight, keep in mind your questions or your comments. So when we end, just simply raise your hand and we will call on you. Thank you very much. Let me get to the correct screen. What is coming with on passive? Mike will begin speaking. Go ahead, Mike. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody, our leadership council members and all our leaders all around the globe. Welcome to um, another edition of uh, our Friday night with Lina Nakamoto and uh, Ron Hubbard. Today, we want to be talking about the data center, what it is all about, because on passive, we'll be getting our own data center. So we thought it wise with Lina Nakamoto that uh, we should be talking about it. Okay, Lynn, go. So we have two basic, two definitions about uh, to talk about the data center. First one says, it is a simple way to assess server storage, data <clears throat> databases and application servers over the internet. Another one says, a space dedicated to holding data servers to store and process data. That is what it is all about, the data center. Now, we have various types of data centers, okay? Okay, so what we, the first one we want to talk about is the enterprise data center, which are typically um, consulted and used by a single organization for their own in, um, internal purposes. These are common among tech giants. So, so most tech giant companies, they decide to create their own small data center that can store their own data. They don't want to go and be paying for storage because if you want to rent a data center, you have to be paying for storage and security, not only storage. You pay for storage and you pay for security. So some of these um, enterprises, which are giants, they like to create their own so that it can serve the purpose. So instead of going to um, rent somewhere to put it, where they will be paying for security and all that, they decide to create their own. The next one is a um, co-location data center. Recording in which, progress. Which, okay. So the next data kind of data center we're talking about is a co-location data center which functions as a kind of um, rental property where the space and resources of the data centers are made available to the people 
willing to rent it. So most of the people now, most um, companies in the industry now, they prefer to go and rent out data centers because they will pay just as they use, or we can say pay as you go. Okay, so the space that you use is actually the exact space that you will pay for. You don't have to pay for the whole data center. No, you will pay for the small space that you rent out. So that is to cut costs, right? Because if you go to go build a very big data center for yourself, it is very, very, very expensive. So, but if you just get a small space and you pay only for the storage capability that they give to you, allocated to you, that is what um, is cut a lot of cost in the managerial uh, rule. Now, we have, we said there's a managed service data center that offers aspects such as data storage, computing and other services, all a third party serving customers directly. So we also have another one. For instance, a company that you pay, other companies pay for other companies to come get their data and go store it for in another position or in another place, which is safe for them. So in this one, what are, we, what are we saying? We're saying there is a third party that's, for instance, I don't just want to call names company A. Let's say company A and company B and company C. So company C should be the, let's say, is the owner of the data. Then company B is the one that is contracted to go and pick information of company A and store it in company C's data center. So that is how it is managed. Now we have the one that is the cloud data center. They are distributed and are sometimes offered to customers with the help of a third party managed um, service provider. So this, same, this is another one. Now, instead of having a physical building that you have all the data stored in that, in that building, we have it in the cloud environment. So we have so many giants of the cloud environment that will be seeing them as we go down this, um, this presentation. Next slide, please, Ms. Lee. Now, this is an example of a data center. If you see the technician standing right there, he has his laptop or a desktop. Now, basically, you don't just go and keep the data there and you leave them. So you should have somebody who will be taken care of because the, the job of this person, he, can, he might be a Linux system administrator who is the person, who is the main person that has access to most of um, the servers that are found there. So what do they do? The job of a Linux system admin, they will do, they will troubleshoot, okay? They will do um, a lot of system hardening, okay? They will do a lot of user management to add users into the system and all that. And they will do monitoring. So what he is doing there right now is monitoring. So he's monitoring all the, all the servers that are there. Just with some, we have some particular commands that we use them on the, on the um, we can call it a command line interface, okay? So all of that, they also do patching. They patch all those servers, have you see them for the, the, they patch them for, for, for vulnerability. They scan them so that they should not be vulnerable to any man in the middle or hackers, as we call them commonly in English. But in our, um, in uh, the IT world, we we'll say man in the middle or man in the middle, okay? Now, they also do, right there as it is, they also do installation, configuration, and decommissioning of servers. As he's standing there, that is, you don't know what he's really doing, but those are the things that the people in the back, it's a back-end job, okay? A Linux system admin is a back-end guy. That is what he's doing there, and that should be, is should be a Linux system, I mean, standing right there. So if you see the, 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 the layout of the, the, of, the, of the data center, they are arranged in, in like, in, they're arranged like in a stack, okay? One, two, three. There are so many of them over there, as you see them in one rack. They 
arrange them in racks, one rack, two rack, three racks, you know? So beta centers are basically very big, very, very big, okay? Next slide, please, Miss Lee. Another thing that we should know about the data centers, if you see this other technician, he is looking at the back part, the behind part of the other technician was in the front path. This one is at the back path. So it has a lot of connectivities that connections that they do here, okay? You can have connections for like uh, internet and you have the ones that, that goes internally to wherever your um, office buildings are. And these data centers are always located miles away from where you work. Some even millions of miles, like in different countries. Some people have them in different countries as we'll see as we go um, along. Miss Lin, please. Now you can see how clean the building, the beta center inside is. It is always very clean. There should be no leakage, no leaks. You cannot go there and see any water. No, there should be no, no water. So another thing is that it is very, very noisy. Do you see all those rags that are covered there? They can be some, some companies can be film production companies. They do what is called rendering. And the rendering that they do is on what they call blades, render blades. So those rendering blades, they make a lot of noise, very, very lot of noise. So what happens is <laughs> the noise, they have a lot of fans there. So with all of this, this environment need to be cooled, okay? It need to be cooled. So you have so many large fans, which are blowing, you know, fans are going, so that this, this temperature of here in here should be cold, okay? But no very cold in a way that it can affect the, the functionality of the servers, okay? So another thing, very clean. They are very clean, but they are very noisy. Then most of the data centers are found out sketch of towns. In Canada, where I am, I'm talking now from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. We have most of our data centers are either towards the airport or in the basements of the airport. You can have a very long tunnel, like in Montreal, Quebec, in Canada. Most of the data centers are found where you see the, the train roads under the ground, the route, <laughs> the train roads under the ground. That's where most of the data centers are, so that it should not cause some kind of air pollution, right? Let's go next, Liz, please. Okay, now, the largest data centers in the world, let's get some kind of statistics, right? The largest is China, China um, Telecom, is one of the largest. Then we have China Mobile, they have their own too. Um, the Citadel Campus, we have the Range International Information Group, we have the um, Switch Super Nap. We also have the DuPost uh, Fabros Technology. We have CWL1, and we have Utah Data Center. So those are the, the largest in the world as we speak. Next slide, please, Ms. Lane. Now let's look at it based on country. What is it? We'll see that the country, United States has about 2,653 data centers. And United Kingdom comes second with 451. Then we have Germany, 442. Then we have Canada with 279. We have Netherlands next with um, 274. The next country is Australia with 272. The next one is France with 248. And the next one is 199. So I just wanted to tell the people, we have four kinds of uh, data centers as well. We have the Taiwan, Tai 2, Tai 3, Tai 4. Last, last Friday, somebody asked me a question about that. I did not really get the question very well, but we have four kinds of data centers. Type 1, which is Taiwan, Tai 2, Type three and type four. Thank you very much, Ms. Lin. Next slide, please. Now we have the data center advantages. What are the advantages? 
it is what affordable rates for customers. That's what they offer a lot. Now, robust software and hardware, great system performance. We also have um, customers do not need to hire people to maintain and manage a data center. Then um, instant scalability based on customers' need. Now, um, services are always available, no, uh, like there's no failure and backup in the system. So what does that mean? It means that in, in, in IT, we have kind of, we, we have some kind of um, the environments, we call it the environments in IT, okay? So it costs, like we have customized environment and we have an environment that is just like a generic environment. So the generic environment will be that one that we have the development environment, we have the test or the quality assurance environment, then we have the production environment. So, but when you come to talk about the environment which is customized, you will have an environment will be the, the, the development environment, you have the QA or the testing environment, you will either have a disaster recovery environment or a pre-production environment before a production environment. What is the reason for this? So that there should be a switch so that if your services are getting offline, okay? If you are getting offline, they don't want any downtime. So if the production environment is getting a problem, they will switch immediately either to the pre-production or disaster recovery um, environment because they have the same capability and the same functionalities. All the um, systems that are in the pre-production or disaster recovery is the same as the production. So that if there is any power failure or anything, there will be that switch, very swift, and you will not even understand that there is a problem. Thank you, Ms. Lin. I hand it over back to you. Excellent job, Engineer Mike. Thank you very much. So I'm going to be talking about some other aspects of data centers. The graphic that you see shows the market share of the leading cloud service providers. And as you can see, Amazon Web Services, AWS, has a commanding lead with 32% of the market. Microsoft, Microsoft Azure is a distant second at 19%, followed by Google Cloud, which has just 7% of the market. So you see the top three cloud service providers accounted to for 58% of total cloud spend in the first quarter of 2021. This is an interesting graph. It illustrates Amazon's income from the first quarter of 2014 through the third quarter of 2020. And you can see that the income generated excluding Amazon Web Services is noted here. You see that the growth was not stable. It's a yellow line. You see how erratic the growth was? But when you compare it with Amazon income that includes AWS, you'll see that illustrated with the blue bars. And you can see that there is steady growth when they include AWS. AWS is Amazon's largest source of operating profits. And AWS's revenue makes up to makes up 14.5% of Amazon's total revenue of $110.8 billion. And that was in the third quarter of 2021. Here you see that AWS's quarterly revenue from 2014 to 2021 was very steady. It, was, it grew, it was stable, and there was significant growth. And in the third quarter of 2021, which is at the end of that graph, you'll see that AWS's revenue jumped 39% to 16.11 billion US dollars. There is a high demand for data centers. And why is this? Data generation and use has risen 
leading to a greater demand for data centers. In this age of data, there are about 7 billion internet connected devices, and this number continues to grow. Many of these devices generate large masses of data that must be captured, routed, and retrieved. So companies find it very expensive, expensive and difficult and time consuming to manage all this data in house. So more companies are outsourcing their data operations to third party providers, which specialize in data center operations. And that is why there is a huge and growing demand for data centers. And you can see that in January, 2021, there were 8,000 data centers globally. This is just mind boggling. Let's look at the market size of cloud computing worldwide. It's very, very huge. In 2021, the market size was 445.3 billion US dollars. And the projection for 2026 is 947.3 billion US dollars. Let that sink in. On passive, as you probably are aware of by now, you know that OnPassit is going to have its own data center, which will be completed in about two to three months. And in fact, OnPassit is now migrating its data to this data center. What are the advantage, advantages of having our own data center? Well, first of all, autonomy. OnPassive will have full control over services. There will be no dependence on a third party service provider. This is very important. Secondly is security. OnPassive will be able to protect its valuable intellectual property and sensitive business data. So these are the reasons, some of the reasons why OnPassive has decided to have its own data center. Let's talk about profit sharing. On Passive offers founders the opportunity to share in the profits of the company. There's a monthly distribution of some of the net profits that goes to founders. And as On Passive revenue increases over time, founders will di directly benefit by getting more and more of this profit sharing money. So that's the the bulk of this presentation, it was just designed to give you some food for thought and just to know that the future is very bright as long as you're in on passive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Short and sweet, but enough to give you a taste of data centers and why we should all be so excited about the fact that OnPassive is gonna have its own data center very, very soon. I wanted to give this opportunity to Oliver because he might wanna be adding some, some tidbits for us, Oliver. Oliver Fonte. Yeah, yeah hi, hi everybody. Uh, that was a very good presentation, Michael and uh, Lynn. Um, uh, it's a privilege to be here, and uh, I'm so proud to be an unpassive founder. And, and based on based on my profession, uh, that I've been dealing with um, cloud services and data center, we are in a very good position. I will say that authoritatively, and it was a very good decision for our CEO uh, to make sure that we have our own data our own data center or cloud. And, and cloud because um, the mafia that is in the tech industry, anything can happen with us. Um, anything can happen with our data with AWS. And I was very happy when he he told us that um, they are doing that. Uh, we are we are doing some migration now from um, uh, cloud from um, AWS to our own cloud to our own cloud data center. That was something that I was very happy 
And uh, because the mafia that is there, I think every, if everybody can understand that Donald Trump today with uh, Paolo and uh, AWS that are in court. And for a company like um, Unpassive, a, com a giant monster company like Unpassive to store their data in somebody else's um, uh, cloud center is not, it's, um, it's not a good thing because they can, they can frustrate us and frustrate our customers. So uh, being that we are here, our, and the amount of revenue that our cloud center is going to generate is going to be humongous. Because the way the cloud center and the, the CEO also told us that we are going to have an AI, an AI cloud service that we are not going to have a 2020 cloud services. That is, that is huge. This is something that is going to, the market, we are going to beat, we are going to beat um, Amazon, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud, hands down. Because our security, first, we, um, the CEO told us that we are going to use um, fiber optic lens, fiber optic cables to connect to our servers. If you look at our pictures, if you look at the pictures that what we have now and the speed, if you look at the speed that we do have on when you want to move from when you are your own mail, you want to move from your own mail or when you want to log in, you want to get your um, OTP to, to log in. If you look at the speed, that is fiber optic cables. That's the work of, of fiber optic cables. The brightness, that is fiber optic cables. The security also, the migration of the data, it comes with, they, they, they will use virtual, our um, VPN. We do have the tool and our tool is also with AI. That's, this is something that um, we are going to monopolize the digital space. We are going to monopolize because we have our own tools like the VPN that we are going to use to migrate data. If a customer comes where well, they want to store data within our, in, in our cloud service, the, 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 the customer should not be scared because, because the transmission of those data, and for what I am sure is going to be TL, TLS 1.3, because the one other one that is there is 1.2. I don't want to go, I don't want to go too much technical, but um, when the CEO also told us that um, uh, uh, we are transmitting um, uh, our, our data from different location. I knew, he didn't say it, but I knew already that we are moving into our own cloud service. And he came and confirmed it the other day that we are migrating our, our data. And how are they going to sell it? Customer that comes, it is always in three parts. Software as a service, which is a SaaS solution. Pass, which is a, I mean, a platform as a service and infrastructure as a service. If a customer comes that he wants to use a software as a service that is SaaS, the price is different. The price is going to be different. We should also understand that when they talk about cloud service is virtual, that you can be in any location and you can work in any location. You can work in any, lo in any location in, on, 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 on this planet Earth. So with the pandemic that is now, is we, in fact, our data center is coming at the right time. It's coming at the right time because a lot of companies now, they work from home and they are going to use our cloud and they are going to use our cloud service. Go back to the SaaS solution that I'm talking about. SaaS solution means that in all the companies on passive cloud service will provide all the services for them. The penetration test and the backup, Everything is they are going to do it. A pass also a platform as a service on passive is also going to do three quarter of the job for them to maintain their environment to make sure that the security is good. And infrastructure as a service is the one that you just come and buy buy the space in on passive and your you will manage it yourself. So so you see how now how we are going to make money from the software as a service. The, plat the, the, the platform as a service and the infrastructure as a service. This is going to be something that we are going to be, in fact, then we are going to have other 
different location. I think Michael just talked and Michael also talked touch touch on that. We are, Michael also touched on that, that we are going to have different locations that immediately something happened. Let's say they come and burn our location. Within many second, within second, the, the other location picks it on that you will not even realize. We had a meeting one time with the CEO and uh, when we were moving from our savers to the new life environment, he said that we, that we had a shutdown four times and we didn't, we didn't discover it, we didn't realize it. That is replication, redundancy. This is something that I'm so proud with because when the CEO is talking about these things, I, I'm like, I'm like, you, you know, we are, in the, we are in the market and in the digital world that we are going to own the digital space. I'm not seeing AWS, Amazon, which is AWS, Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud to beat us in anything because our security is going to be perfect. Our speed, at least all of us now, we, we are in beta testing. We've tested it. We know what is coming. We know what is coming. You know, tell me which other company that um, the one they are, that they will not leave and come to on passive cloud service. So um, backups. We always have backups in different locations. Like I think Mike, Mike also, Mike also touch, Mike also touch on, uh, Mike also touch on that. And um, I would like to rest, rest my case. Uh, if any questions, then we'll take it from there. And uh, our market, I just want to make sure to to assure us that where we are, we are going to be the monster in the digital space. And uh, when the CEOs told us that uh, we are how that we have. Um, um a space for one billion data i laugh that will be within six months that will be within six months any company now all plus the u.s federal government they, they, they are moving all their data now they are shutting down all their data centers they are, they, they are moving everything now to 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 cloud so i know we are going to take part of that market and even half or three quarter of that market not talking about Europe, when I look at Europe, it's still a virgin zone. When I look at Asia, it's still a virgin zone. Not talking about Africa. Not talking about Africa. When I went, when I went to Africa, I went to Cameroon, my, my country of origin. I went to banks and some insurance company. I just saw savers and cables anywhere. It will not happen anymore because we are... The good news is that we are in more than 200 countries. Tell me how we are not going to grab all those markets. Our cloud service, like... I uh, think market also touched on that or oh, lean um, that the market cap. I'm telling you, we are fine. Our cloud service, we are going to monopolize it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's bigger than we thought, right? As lay people. Yeah. We know, yeah, data center is all good. On passive, it's going to have its data center. But did we realize what it actually means? What it means to not only us as the founders, but to the world, right? Because our AI powered data center is gonna be very sophisticated. And I believe pricing wise will be undercutting the competition, correct, Oliver? Yes. Pricing? Yeah, the pricing. So the pricing. A, I, I just say it's gonna be priced in three different levels. Software as a service, a platform as a service, which is pass and infrastructure as a service. So in these three in these three forms, I know my company pay one million dollar just to do the migration, one million dollars for migration, and it was within two to three months, and it was a small data center. So we are going to make money also from that end to migrate a lot of data from the, the original data center to the other data center, and we are going to also have um, how do you call it? Third parties. I know a third party that I, I, my company now, they want $3.7 billion. They get our data and they store those data in AWS. I will not call the name for, for those are proprietary information. So we are going to have a lot of third party that they will deal with that, they'll come and deal with us. We have a lot of third parties that will come and deal with, and that's where we're also going to make super money. Thank you. Thank you. So it's 
could be possible that our revenue through the data center could exceed revenue through our digital products. That's possible. Yes. Um, the good news there is that the good news here, I think the CEO also told us, uh, said that last time that all we are going to store our data. Remember that he told us that only um, Go Founder before Go, Go Founder before, which is now O Founder, he pays 30, I think it's thirty five thousand dollars a month for that. That money now stays with us. That money now stays with us. Look at what. Let me call name Walmart. I think you had in one of your slides pays thirty million dollar every month to store their data. Imagine if we do have one or two billion customers, how much are we going to pay Amazon if they if they hold, if they have our data? That should be a, that should be between ten to twenty million dollar a month. But now we have our own data center. We store everything within us. You know, the money comes back to us. It's a circle. It's a circle. The money comes back to us. You know, so um, this is um, um, this is a game changer. This is a game changer in the world. It's a revolutionary. On passive is going to be a revolutionary company. That in fact. We should be careful. We should be careful. I'm very happy. I'm proud because when I listen to the, our CEO talk, I laugh. I just laugh. I laugh. I see if if all the founders know what is coming, if the founders will know what is coming and where we are. That's why I keep telling people: don't look at the ninety-seven dollar. That is not the value of what you're going to get. That is not the value. If you want to look at the value. The CEO at least should be it should be at least three or five thousand dollars for the value of one account. For one account, it should be at least five thousand dollars. But don't compare it. Don't I don't want I, I, I keep telling my, my my team members and other friends do not compare that ninety seven dollars. It's just because on passive is built out of heart and love, humanitarian. So as an IT person, when I look at it, I look at other companies, the money that they make. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mind blowing, that's what I say. There must be another word for mind blowing, but that's what comes to my mind. Just amazing, just amazing. All right, we have engineer Mike Ojan Tambia who would like to say a few words. Okay, again, once more people are come again with another perspective now. Thank you very much, big bro, Uncle Oliver Fonte from the All Winners team. Let me tell you people this. I see Madi is just looking at me. Okay, let me say it. So, as a Linux system administrator, I'm a Red Hat certified Linux system admin working in the industry as well. So we had a, um, I just wanted to enlighten you people what is calling migration is all about. The migration project is a huge project and will bring a lot of money. So if you have your equipment or you have your savers in your environment where you have, in your office building and stuff. We call it in the IT world on premise. Now, migrating, let me say it again. If you have your equipment, your servers at your job in, a, in an office business building on an office space, we call it on premise. Now, if you have them somewhere else, it will be in either a data center or it will be in the cloud environment. Now, to migrate, to migrate, you pay per server, pay the information they want you to, to migrate them. For instance, they just want to get just some data from the, from the, from the on-premise to the cloud environment. We had a project like last year, and the project was to migrate this um, client of, the client had just, uh, about 50 servers. So the fifth, just 50 servers. So migrating 50 servers, their database from the on-premise to the cloud environment. 
Okay, that project lasted for about, you know, you know, in uh, in IT, that, that's the thing about IT. So we should be understanding some of these things now as we IT people, we come here and break them down for you. That Uncle River is breaking it. I want to break this all so to you people. A, a, a migration project, which starts, basically, you will say, oh, this project will finish it in two weeks. But guess what? You're not finished in you know, two weeks. You can never. That is what the, 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 we have people that they call, they call the, um, how do they call it? They call them the, uh, the, the scrum masters. They'll come and be telling you that, oh, because of this, this, you can do that just for two months, for three months. No, it's not at all. For an IT project, you can never specify. You can never say, I'll do this in two days. No, you can never. Guess what? We, all of us, were talking as a team. It is a team of 15 engineers talking. Linux system engineers, database administrators, database engineers. And also, we have the DevOps engineers, a team of 15 people. We are working together to, for this project. This project has just 50 servers. So in a nutshell, we can say, oh, will we do this just for three weeks, two weeks, one week? Not at all. Never say that. It will never work. Now, we planned everything and we started a project. We ended up, that project ended up for six months. Those were 50 servers. Just for six months. Now, all passive has more than 50 products. Okay, plus products. If we were to migrate on-premise data to a cloud environment, just 50 servers for six months. So if we have 50, just imagine that a product as big as old staff. Imagine how many servers can old staff be running all over the world in all the countries. Okay, let's put it that it is about it is about, let's just say about a hundred servers. Let's put it at that. So a hundred servers, we were to do just migration of data from on-premise to cloud. For 50 servers, we were to use the Scrum, the Scrum masters or whatever, they say two, three weeks. We ended up doing it in six months. So just imagine how a, a, a hundred plus or a thousand servers will be. That is a monster that on passive has. So in, in this, in IT, you can never just really say, oh, we did it in this number of duration. No, Even, everything is going well. There will always be something. So I just want to let us all know that that migration will be something that will give us a lot of money in on passive. So for that 50 servers, do you know how much it, so we were doing it in bits. The first part was just to do the databases, to, 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 to transfer the databases all from the cloud, from the uh, on-premise to the cloud, to migrate them. Migrate is another word for transfer, okay? It's just to transfer them from one, one location to the next. So it took, one, for one server, how much we charge? One server is $5,000. That's 5,000K, that's 5K, just 5K just to transfer those databases from the on-premise to cloud. So for 50 servers, how, many, how much is that? That's a lot. That's the first part. Now, as a Linux system administrator and all the other database people, we need to take now all other information. For instance, if, they, if we had some, if, one of the servers was a, an HTTP server, a server that has HTTP on it, hypertext transfer protocol, which is transfer protocol, which is um, HTTP, which is one of the protocols that most websites are being built on. Most websites are built on HTTP and PHP, but like 98% should be on, on, on HTTP. So we have to transport now that one, transport, transfer, or migrate is the same word. We have to take it down to from on-premise, and go to the cloud. 
for that one, we are charging 4K, like $4,000. So for that, the 50 servers, how much is that? So that is done. Then we will come now to, again, decommission all, <laughs> it is not ended like that, the job has not ended. We now to decommission all the other servers, the older ones, which are 50 of them, we have to decommission them. And per decommission again is like 3,500 per decommission. So for 50 servers, how much is that? So just to give you an idea that companies will come for us to migrate their data, to migrate it from on-premise to cloud. That is a lot. I just want to throw all that to us there. I mean, I have a lot of people who understand what I'm saying. Thank you everybody again. Thank you, Mike, for elucidating us on that. Another revenue stream for Unpacta. That's big money. Good for us, good for the company. Great, thank you. Next, we have Jeffrey Morla. Please unmute yourself and share, Jeffrey. Wow, that, that was a lot of good tech, a lot. I got my money's worth. I got my admission right in that. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and by the way, thank you, Lynn and, and Marty and uh, Chris and Ron for, for hosting this. <clears throat> I'm gonna, I, I get picked on a lot, but I want to kind of just hit like two or three little subjects just to kind of explain in layman's terms. Um, the first thing I think is, you know, why do we have to have data centers? Uh, Mike started to touch on this, and it's simply because data centers are controlled environments where the servers are kept, right? I mean, they're essentially temperature and humidity or humidity rather controlled environments because this allows the machines to operate either at a premium or an optimum uh, or at least safe conditions. Uh, I mean, he, he was talking about noise and it gets hot. There's a lot of heat. I mean, when you're starting to data, data dump and, and you start to crunch like these things do, it generates a lot of heat. So there's a lot of AC going on and there's a lot of controlled environment. So that's why we've got to have it. Uh, and I love too that they, they, they touched on the application services and we can drill this right down and specifically match this to on passive because application services actually, those providers, they make up a large segment of the business that provide the software-based services to other companies, right? And these are services usually done across the network. And examples are the ASP services, which are web hosting and email. You may have heard Mr. Mufara talking about when, when we start our own web hosting and we're controlling our own uh, data, uh, data centers with our own emailing, then we can also control the gate for, for all of those things, which means we get to define or define what spam is and what the parameters are and just a lot of things like that. So this is how... This is why this is appropriate and this is applying to on passive as, as, as what we're using the data center for. Another one uh, engineer Mike talked about was, uh, and you can see this, it, it's plastered right on the front of the onpassive.com site where it says that we are a software as a service provider, right? Oliver mentioned this earlier. Well, it's a lot cheaper sometimes to purchase software only when you need it, then it is to buy a lifetime license, right? Uh, especially if you're buying it for a lot of people or you know for a huge company or something. And accessing this software as a service through the web without installing it on your devices, which they'll they'll be able to do through us. That's how we're making money with this thing. It lets their people work together by sharing a lot of data from a central location, which is kind of cool. And the last thing I really want to drill down into is. How are we going to make money? And, and that's, you know, because you say we're, we're talking about data centers. How is that relevant to on passive? Well, we, we're going to make a lot of money. And how do they? And I'm going to give you an analogy so that people can just understand, oh, wow, okay, this is what we're doing. And, not, and most of what they said earlier, the, the tech heads before me, it'll, it'll make a little more sense. But data centers, uh, they're, uh, they're like a hybrid company and i mean they're relatively new on the scene but they're a hybrid between something like uh real estate and technology and services right and, and the kind of function that if you think about a hotel where you go in and you rent a room right that would be like a server but you rent it for as long as you need to right host your website server right 
I mean, the hotel offers you everything that you need, right? I mean, housekeeping and room service and laundry and power and maintenance and meals. That's kind of like what we're doing with the data centers, right? The work that goes on in the data centers are the services that are rendered to generate the income. But I hope that kind of helps. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good analogy, I think, because, you know, do you really want to build your own hotel? Do you want to? Right, right. And that's why they come. Oh, and as long as I'm, uh, if I can, um, I don't know if people really understand exactly what a server is, because it sounds kind of, kind of nebulous a little bit, you know, but a server, it, think of that like your waiter, I guess. I mean, it serves in, information to computers that connect to it. In other words, when, when users connect to a server, they can access programs and files and other server information. And like, like Mike had just said, uh, most of those use the uh, HTTP protocol, uh, which you know sends web pages and stuff to a user's computer. So that's, that's what it's serves. It's like a waiter. Thank you. <laughs> great, great information. I guess Mike wants to share some stuff with us, Mike. Yeah, for Jeffrey. Jeffrey, these are servers. All of these on the left hand side. These are servers. Yeah, that's all of these awesome. are servers. Yeah, these are servers. So they can connect. Maybe these servers are found in Australia. I stay here in in Canada. I can log into them because I work with them right remotely. So that's what we're saying remotely. So they are virtual. You can't touch them. But it has all the components that you can think of. Look at it. It has a CPU. The CPU is, uh, <laughs> it has a CPU. Remember the CPU, the central processing unit that before the old is in the 80s and 90s or early 2000s, they used to have them under the table or, or you put them somewhere, you know? Yeah. But these <laughs> ones are virtual ones. So let me show you what it is. Let me show you um, um, system. Oh, sorry. Hey, Mike, while good. you're looking at that, if you can yeah. also address, uh, you started to a little bit ago, but if you can also talk about your redundancy here, yes, that, I think that would be a good thing too. Okay, sir, no worries. So these are processors. So the processor you say this one has one CPU. So imagine if we were in those early 80s and 90s or the early thousands, like I have over, I have over 500 servers on here. So it means we'll be having CPUs, 500 CPUs stuck up in a very big environment. So the cloud environment is the answer for all of these things. We keep this environment in the cloud. And so it's cost, it reduces the cost, operation cost for the CEOs because we don't need to go and rent so many data centers anymore. We go to the cloud environment because it's pay as you go. So you don't want, if you want to go take a big, um, how do they call it? A, a big data center, you have to be paying for security. You have to be paying for technicians to be doing all the job that they're doing and all that. Now, when we talk about redundancy, it's like you have like in, in the Linux, in the Linux world, we we'll call it, we say, um, we call it the de, um, decommissioning. Okay. So those decommissioning just means that these, some of these servers, if you don't need them anymore, you can, decommission them. It has a process for it, okay? So for instance, we start with a 30 days notice. You will go and create a ticket, all right? You see a ticket like how we go to our back office, we create ticket, it's the same thing. But in the, in the IT world, most companies use what is called ServiceNow, okay? It is a ticketing system called ServiceNow. And we have our own ticketing system in Unpassive called Odesk. So you will go to service now and you will ask, for instance, this server name is uh, server 85. You will go and write on there and ask from, and remember, first, you don't just do things in the IT world without permission, okay? So we have something that we call the chain of command, right? It's, we have chain of command. You must always ask from your, from your hierarchy. So we call it the, the, the chain of command. So I will go to my hierarchy. Hey boss, this server is using a lot of resources. What do we do with it? I've been seeing it here, but I've not ever seen some, somebody logging into the server. It is disturbing us. It's, it's 
I mean, it is blocking some space for some, I mean, appliances or some servers. So I will say who, in 30 days, I will give a notice. Who, who is the owner of server 85? They will tell me. If they don't tell me within that 30 days, I will go for a second 30 day and ask again, who, who is the owner of server number 85? If nobody still turn up, I will go the third time, which is 90 days now. Who is the owner of server number 85? If the person show up, good and fine. So I will tell the person, oh, your server is eating up a lot of resources. What do you, are you really using the server? Because if the person is not using the server, we need to take it off connection, right? Because it is resources. We're, we're, we're trying to minimize resources, right? So I'll ask again, the third, 30 days, which is 90 days now, who is the owner? If nobody owns it up, I'll decommission it. So decommissioning just means delete or redundant. Just kill it completely. Take it off connection. Take it off the network and all of that. Is that okay, Jeffrey? Lane, is Jeffrey there? Uh, absolutely. I, yeah, I'm loving it. I'm eating this stuff up. And, and you're, I mean, you're schooling me and you're showing me stuff that I don't get access to. So life is good. But I okay. did want you, if you can tell, uh, because I know that with clouds, you know, and yeah. a lot of people are like, are, are clouds like data centers? And I'm like, like, yeah, think of a cloud as a, uh, like as a remote data center, so to speak. So yeah, you can use a remote. It. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if you can talk a little bit about the redundancy that we're going to have and the need for redundancy, then I think, I, I think that that'll help too, because I know that on passive is looking at doing that. And I know that you had talked about it a little bit ago when you're talking about the speed with just, and you didn't even feel the hiccup when one went down and the other one popped up. Yes. So that one is talking about what is called, um, one second, let me use my paint here. Uh oh, sorry, let me take off this one. Sorry, people, I just like, when I'm explaining things, I like to go, if I'll go techie, I'll go techie and let's get it done. So, if in a, you know, where is, in, a, in an environment, okay, environment we just put it env we have we have like we have the, the 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 development environment development we'll just call it the dev and uh, we have the uh, the dev um the qa qa or it's called either the qa or the test test or you can see call it the staging then we have another one which is uh the 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 prod now p r o d so the prod production environment now this is the generic environment that we have okay this is called a generic one now we have another environment which is not generic this one now is the one that is customized so the customized oops the customized environment now will be customized customized env so the customized environment will we have the dev the qa q is still again qa qa or test or what again staging staging then we have the other one is either pre-prod is either pre-prod pre-rod and or the disaster recovery and we have the prod at the end. So this environment, what is the, the use of this? Like Jeff Moloch is talking about redundancy. So the reason is that in, a, in, an, in an IT environment, right? We have the development environment, we call it the dev. We have the QA, the test or the staging. This is the, 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 this is the environment where, when these codes are being created in a development environment, they are being tested to see how they function so that if there is any bug fixes, bug is just like any hindrance in the code. They can fix it before sending it to production. Now, most companies are like a big company like, uh, like us in, in all passive. They will have an environment which will be the development environment which the codes are being developed there. 
have a QA, which is the, the, the quality assurance. QA just means quality assurance or testing. They will, they will have also have the staging environment. Now, we have the pre-production environment or disaster recovery environment, which will be a, a mimic that they'll imitate the production environment. So all the services, all the, 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 the services and whatever we have in the pre product and the, and the disaster recovery is the same thing as a production environment. What is this reason? What, what, why is this? It should be because so that if there is any power failure or there's any problem in the production environment, these environments will take off immediately the pre-production or the disaster recovery environment so that there will be, remember in any business that is supposed to be online, you want to minimize downtime as fast as possible. Just being offline for one minute causes a lot in the, in, in the internet space. So the reason for the pre-prod and the disaster recovery environments that resemble the production environment is so that when there is that changes, nobody should notice it. Does that make any sense now, Jeffrey? He's good, he's good. He's, <laughs> he's smiling and he's good. Thank you so much, Engineer Mike. You're welcome, everybody. All righty. Thank you very much for that education. Now, let's see who we've got. We've got Tony Monk, who would like to share with us. Go ahead, Tony. Hello, Lynn. I'm going to be a gentleman and let Cindy Hopkins speak first. How are you doing? Great webinar, by the way. I'm going to let Cindy Hopkins speak first. I'd like to hear her beautiful voice. I haven't heard from her for a while. <laughs> Hello, Cindy. I'm glad you're here, Cindy. You can unmute. I've asked you to unmute. Just click the button and you can speak. She may be away, Tony. So you go ahead and take the floor and, and she'll come back. Oh, okay, she could be. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, great information tonight. Wow, thank you so much for that, uh, for that uh, information that you guys went through um, uh, about the data center. I just, I have a question because I'm not IT, I'm not an IT guy, <laughs> as all of you know, but uh, it's, it's I hate fascinating. To, I, hate it really to interrupt you. I hate to interrupt you, Tony. Oh, I don't there know. she is, there she is. Okay, I'll let you go. I'll, oh, no. <laughs> Well, you know what? I was clicking on it and clicking on it. It wasn't doing a darn thing. <laughs> but thank you, by the way, Tony. And, you know, a huge thank you to Lynn and, of course, Ron and Marty uh, and then Mike and uh, all you folks. I mean, um, Oliver uh, and Jeffrey Morlock always, you know, with his wonderful input and questions. This has been an awesome, awesome webinar so far. I mean, a very, very enlightening. Really appreciated what Mike had to say as well. And some of the questions and I was reading some of the remarks too that Tony made and I really liked it. And I'm sure you'll elaborate a little bit, Tony. But, um, you know, I, I just want to, I'm not techie, okay? We all know that about me. If you guys have been a founder for two or three years or four, you or close to four, you know, I am not techie. I do love people and I love the idea of profit sharing with our company and knowing that, you know, uh, the, our company was going to look out for people and help build their business. And all they had to do was be an ethical founder and then purchase product come time to when we launch. And uh, the fact that this market, I mean, our digital products and um, the digital world, uh, you know, the digital world globally is just growing at a massive, massive rate of speed. And the fact that we are invited and uh, not just invited, but our company is being set up and built to share in the profits. And this company of ours, our beautiful company, our CEO is making sure that we will all share in each and every aspect of the digital world, of all the digital products and, and of, of everything that we offer, we will be profit sharing. And so uh, I think it was Mike that mentioned it, it might've been Oliver, but, but um, I'm really not sure, but the, you know, um, I think it was Oliver that, that, you know, the, the, the cost, the $97 is just, you know, it's just ridiculous. But at the same time, 
you know, we aren't launched yet. We are founders, but really mark my words, all you wonderful founders out there. This is uh, our little founder position is a piece of digital real estate that years from now, I mean, it is, we'll be owning Hilton's all over the world or we'll be only, I mean, it, to me, it, it each position is just a, a huge a huge value in digital real estate. And that's the way I look at it. And I look at it uh, in my non-digital, non-technical mind. Okay, Tony's going to love this. But, you know, I we could be a, I could be a, a, the, the only grower in the United States of vegetables and of produce. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a, I'm a data, a data center. All right. But all of the grocery stores, all of the farmer's markets, Everyone has to come to me to get my product in order to sell it to the individuals that are going to buy it. That is a data center, folks. And that is what we'll be sharing the prophecy. We have to have the data centers in this digital technological world, okay? They have to be there and we will be sharing in that. So you can be the grower of all of the product in, in, in your country. And every store, every market would have to go to you to get that product. Now, again, there's there's more than one data center, but not very many when you look at the global market uh, or say you are the gasoline, which we're not going to have gasoline powered vehicles all that much longer. But for a long time, gasoline it was huge. You had to have it if you were going to have a vehicle, you had to have it. And um, but it, and you, if you were the only supplier of gasoline to all the gas stations in your country or in your neck of the woods, and that you received a bit of profit from each and every person gasoline and every long vehicle, every truck, every every all of those tools and all of those or all of those pieces of equipment needed that gasoline and you were earning a little bit of profit it doesn't have to be very much profit i would rather have you know one percent of the efforts of a hundred people than a hundred percent of the efforts of one person and that's kind of this you know to make to generate a few pennies on on millions or thousands of purchases or users is going to be huge guys and and, and again, I just, I, I really, really appreciated Mike and Oliver's input on this because I've learned a lot and I will get more techie than I even want to be. But I thank you for that. I thank you, all you wonderful founders, all you caring people. You guys are incredible. And and the fact that you show up and help each one of us, I, I am just, uh, I feel the same way that's been said a hundred times tonight already almost, the, uh, that I am honored to be in this beautiful crowd of people and to be connected with each and every one of you. And I thank you. And Tony Monk, God bless you, honey. <laughs> Back to you, all right? Thank you, Cindy, for your contribution. I think you helped us understand with that market <laughs> analogy. You know, you can kind of picture it. It makes more sense to me now. So I appreciate that. <laughs> It well, really made me techies. understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it helped me as well. I'm a non-techie, so thank you so much. Alrighty, thank you. So now we've got. Can you uh, can you, can, oh. you can you mute me before you give it back to Tony? Mine won't. My button's not working for some reason. Sure. Right. Hi, Tony. Hi, Lynn. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it was great to hear from you, Cindy. I haven't heard from you for a while. Cindy, Jeff, and I, and a couple of us go back all the way four years back, right, right to the beginning of it all. Isn't that amazing? Now we've got a data center. <laughs> I mean, think about that. That's just amazing. You know, Jeff, I, I, I thought the same thing. Like years ago, when I thought of a data center and servers, I thought of a big room with a whole bunch of like huge, you know, a bunch of computers and it took up a lot of heat and stuff like that. Now it's all internal. It's not even external anymore. We don't have to rent spaces with machines and stuff. Everything's done online. And uh, and that's amazing. That's really, really amazing. And to, and to have a piece of that, that's just phenomenal. And the thing is, we're also going to rent out our data uh, uh, um, space to a lot of companies that are going to be using us. So that's going to be even more revenue in our, in our pockets. In the old days, uh, I, I get the privilege to talk to Oliver. Uh, almost every day we talk. And Oliver 
teaches me a lot that uh, about the IT part of it. I'm still I'm still a little baby in kindergarten stages learning about it, but uh, we talk a lot. We we inspire each other because we're so we're so passionate about on passive and about the journey that we've uh, we've taken and the journey that's going to be uh, uh, ongoing here. But uh, my my question is to Oliver, uh, my brother. Uh, is this uh, in the old days when I used to have like a domain name and uh, and and landing pages and funnels? I used to use cPanel to to load to load these things to to rent their space to put the stuff on it. Is a data center similar to a cPanel, but it, but 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 say a thousand times more than a cPanel? Yeah, the answer is yes. More sophisticated even. Yes, and most, I think the CEO told us about, talk about cPanel, that we are going to have cPanel. You can come and have your own small space and have your cPanel there. Yes, it's going, to be, it's going to be sophisticated because it's going to be with AI. What is AI? Machine learning. Machine learning now, we are going to program or fit those algorithms in the AI that is going to dictate any, any um, bad guys that want to come into the system. So like the other cloud service that are now, they cannot, they are not going to compete with us because the CEO has, he mentioned it that we are going to have an AI data center. So we are going to program all those networks that, that are going to dictate any bad guys that want to come in, the penetration testing, everything, the vulnerability scanning, everything is going to be, is going to be there that the bad guys will not be able to tamper with us. And, a lot of companies are going to move and come to us because of that, because of our AI cloud center, data center. So bad guys, you're talking about hackers. Hackers, yes. The hackers, right, all of The hackers, okay. oh, yep, yep, the hackers. I have one more question, just one more question and I'll let, uh, I know yes, there's sir. a lot of hands up. Uh, my next question is, uh, what kind of security features are we gonna have to, to protect us from these hackers? What oh, kind I of security it. features do you guys use now? Like well, um, one, one that I always recommend to where I work to all the vendors, penetration testing, the annual pen test, the annual penetration testing, which is um, it's being done by a third party. I don't know how um, our CEO wants to do with us. Maybe we are going to have a separate department for that, but they say all, all IT security um, company department, they do have um, um, that department, but I always recommend a third party to do it because what they do, they will hack the system, pound it, protect it, hack it, protect it, hack it, protect it. It's, it's a process that takes about six, six years. I mean, six months, I'm sorry, about six months to do that. Then after that, they have to have vulnerability scanning or they might have also automatic pen test. I always recommend automatic pen test after they've done a manual annual pen test, a one-time thing every year that is going to be certified, then now they can be doing their normal automatic penetration testing. Then also after that, the vulnerability scanning can come. It might be monthly, two weeks, it depends on the company. Then later now they start doing the patching. So mm -hmm. even, the, even the malwares, even the malware, even the uh, we have to we also have to protect it using like you go to you can buy your malware in the store to protect your um, your your personal um, laptop. So those are a lot of ways are there to protect our our system. But penetration test, the annual one time pen test is what I always recommend. Then they can do their quarterly or monthly um, uh, automatic pen test and also vulnerability scanning. Then they start doing the patching. Great, thank you so much, brother Oliver. Appreciate welcome, that. That was welcome, just fantastic, fantastic welcome, information. Brother. So there's lots to be excited about. Oh my God, I, I I'm just very because if you understand if you understand the big picture, you, believe me, you won't be able to sleep tonight. Thank you yeah. so much, Lynn, for letting me speak. I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. The good news is that we have AI, and with AI, is machine learning. Machine learning, we 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 train AI how to handle things and to protect the system for us. So before you come there's an alert in the system. So the, so the hackers cannot even tamper to come in. So what AWS they are trying to do now, they are trying to patch, but we are going with our own is going to be from scratch, from foundation up. Why that the, the other ones is being made that what they are trying to do now with AI there is they are just patching, but patching. 
So tell me why tell me why the other companies will not come to us because they know that we are secured. I would, they're, 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 they, if, if, if a CEO wants to sleep, he will sleep well because he knows that all his data are being secured. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Glenn, can I add something real quick? Certainly. Yeah, uh, along with what Oliver and what Tony asked, Ash has a staff that was hired to hack their own system. Okay, that's what they're there for. They hack, when something's done, they send it to them, can you hack into this? So they go in there and try to open the safe, uh, another way to look at it. And if they can, they say, how did you get in? And they beef it up even more so that somebody else can't do it. That I know they have now. So it's, it's just to add what they were saying when you talk about security, that's inside. They're doing it, they're, they're attacking themselves to see if they can get in. Wow, that's, that's huge. Yep. Wow, thank you so much, Murray. That's fantastic. Yep. Yeah, to add, to add to that, that is what we call in IT security penetration test that, that I just talked about, that they will hack the system, then see if, the, then, then they will try to penetrate the system again. Hack it again, try to penetrate it again, hack it again until when the system is like, is, is totally secured. Is when, when, when you had this, um, the presidential election here in the United States between um, 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 Hillary Clinton and um, Donald Trump, the, the, the US federal government brought all the CISOs all over, all over the whole United States to come and hack the CISOs so that no external bad guys can come in to hack so that to, to fraud the election. So it's very, very important. And the good news with us, I keep saying it, we have AI from scratch that we will use AI to hack and protect, hack and protect the penetration test. Thank you. Just a follow up again, Lynn. I just wanted to add this again. So in the, I'll talk most of the time to bring up another thing in the Linux world, okay? So if we have Linux servers, Okay, we have them Red Hat servers, either CentOS or Red Hat servers. The version number number um, seven and number eight, they have an external or sorry, an internal um, security, which is called SE Linux. SE Linux means security enhanced Linux. So those the security enhanced Linux, it has three stages. Okay. So now, when the system, you build your Linux server, those servers that I just showed you people a while ago, if you build your Linux servers that are there, right there, most of the servers are uh, seven and eight systems. So they have this SE Linux, which is a built-in security for them. So it, it helps the system to dictate or to filter any outgoing and incoming data. So it's not just anything just come to the system and it takes it. No, it filters them. That's what Uncle Oliver is calling the penetration test as we're talking about. This system, which they are Linux system, they do the penetration test themselves if they, they have, because they have the SE Linux built in them. So if our servers in Hyderabad, if we have most of them in with Linux, it has CentOS flavor or Red Hat flavor, the seven and eight systems, most of them, they have the SE Linux built in in them which is, um, is a security measure that helps the system to dictate or to filter ingoing and oncoming data. Thank you very much. Yeah, in, in addition to that, also let me add that, I, I, I think it's um, uh, my brother, um, Tony asked about cPanel. cPanels are now, they come with um, um, Linux and, or Unix operating system. And we, we all know that Unix and Linux operating system they have an original inbuilt security. That's why Apple, all Apple products are being, are being built with the Unix or Linux operating system because they have a, a defense or, or already in it. That's why they cannot use API. You cannot use um, any other external um, um, operating system or machines to, to link it to them. And our CEO did a very smart thing with all our products. All our products have API that is that is built in, the, in them so that we can use any other external. But I want to talk about this the, the C panel. C panel that the, 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 the way they build the, the, they build them is with 
Unix and Linux operating system that has that defense, that defense already for security. So we are powerful. We are powerful. I will not lie. When the CEO talk, I just look, I don't, I don't know what is that doing behind that. I can just visualize with, with my background and know that this is what is going on and this is what is going on. So when it comes to security, we should not, we should not be, we should not panic. I know as a security person, I will not give 100 percent but I know we are we are fine. Thank you. Thank you. Very impressive. Mind boggling. Next, we have uh, Dr. Bill Williams. Come on down. Hey, everybody. Good to see you this evening. Happy birthday, Marty. I um, I had an analogy I thought would be useful. You know what I saw when we were talking about these data centers and all the capabilities that we have? I thought about an all-inclusive resort. You know how you can go and most places in the U.S., you, you get a hotel, but then you got to go out to dinner and pay for dinner. Then you got a movie or a theater, you got to pay for the theater. And then you go to the spa and you pay for the spa. Well, down in Mexico, where Red is, and I'm going to be down there starting next week trying to find Red. I don't know if I'll find him, but I'm going to look for him. If you stay at an all-inclusive, you've got your hotel, your choice of four or five restaurants. You've got your tours included. You've got the beach. You've got the pool. You've got your Wi-Fi included. You know, some places you have to pay for it. Everything's included in an all-inclusive. And that's what on passive is. Now that we have our data center, you know, we have our websites. They're going to host it. They're going to service it. They're going to market, close sales, provide income. It's an all-inclusive, one-size-fits-all all under one roof, everything for everybody. You know, it's cradle to grave. If you join, you're basically set. So that was an interesting analogy, I thought. There was a time when um, Ash was talking a lot about the matrix and three and free and building your downline groups. And then about a year ago, he changed his tune. He said, we're not talking about these matrices and we're not talking about these structures anymore. And one thing he said that was important was we're going to have a different source of income that's not related to these structures. And I think he was thinking right then about a data center that would be income sharing, revenue sharing from the side. Because you remember he said, we're gonna have income from above, income from below, which that sounds like a team and commissions, but what's coming from the side, I couldn't figure it out, but it's, it's the income that comes in where we don't do anything. And that should give everybody around the world comfort to feel good about income coming in where there's no activity on their part in terms of sales of your team. It'll be divided up among the team, of course. That's an interesting thought. That's true revenue sharing. That's just not compensation based simply on sales that come under your team. So that's, that's, to me, that shows that what he said, this is bigger than you can think it is. This is the reason. So um, I had a question for Oliver and Mike, and it's, it's a rhetorical question, but as you were giving your presentation on the technology of the data centers, I thought, is there any way that this prognostication could not happen? I mean, when Ash says it's a done deal, if this data center thing is as good as it sounds, and it is, I'm sure, then this is a done deal. The income stream just doubled from what it was when we all joined. Thanks. For Thank you. Yeah, Oliver, you me, want to take that? Yeah, let me let me take it. Um, in security, in IT security, you don't give 100%. So you don't give 100% that your system is going to be secured 100%. But with with what we have now, I'll give between 80. And for and, and for somebody like me in the IT security department to give 80, 90, that is a that is a lot. And why do I say that? Because like I said before, we have our virtual, which is a VPN. 
you know, we have our virtual network, which is VPN, that we use for the transmission of the data. And like I said, I know what Ash can do. It's going to be TLS 1.3, which is the latest now in the market to protect the transmission of data. So if any company wants to come and buy our product, uh, then, then the one, since it's cloud is virtual, they want to work from home, they want to be any part of this world to work, they will have the VPN that they work to protect their data. That is, it's like a pipe that you protect to pass your data through. Again, let me come again to come now to say that our data center is being built with artificial intelligence. That is you, we you is you with the, to easily detect all the cyber threat that are coming in. Now, which we should also understand that the the most dangerous people in uh, to to attack are the insiders. Insiders are people who are most that are most dangerous which are, when, when it comes to IT environment. So there are policies and procedures that that most that most of the employees in there working working in there that within every three months they have to they have to make sure that they meet all the company minimum policy requirements. So as they give limited privileges to people who are who are working so that you have access to only this particular area that you don't have anything to do also on the, on the other end. Look like the federal government. Before you work with the federal government, you have um, um, you have um, um, they, they, they have to do you um, um, clearance. They do you clearance so that you have limited section that you can work based on your clearance because that is also to protect data. So other companies like my company, I cannot even take a bribe. Somebody wants to give me $10 for gift. No way. I cannot, I can't take it. Or even gift card. I can't take it. We all have limited privileges and with on passive it's going to be we, we have that but it's be it's left on you that the company that want to come and buy our services you will know how to give those privileges to your to your um, employees that has nothing to do with on passive when you come and buy our pro our product we will protect it at our end on passive will protect it at their end but from inside your company you have to have those policies that will that that your employees they should not be able to that because as an employee, you have access to, to those data, to some of this data. So let me ask you about when you're talking about this uh, danger from within. Yeah. What about the uh, ransomware, the hackers that get in there for ransom around the world? Those guys, do we have a special thing about on passives data centers and artificial intelligence that will protect us on that? And will we have our own antivirus? system yeah. or use yeah. others yeah. yeah yes yes we do ai alone like i just said before that ai alone has its own security and cyber dict dictation and alert that would that also protect then we also have the our vpn our virtual network that has that will also protect so at, that's why i say at our end in the way i look at it i don't know what is how it's going to look that but when i just picture what ash is saying I can I can authoritatively say that our system and our cloud center are going to be well protected. Let me add our... it in a different way there, yeah. Oliver. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Dr. Bill, let me take you somewhere. Let me do something for you. Let me do something different so that you can really get a little bit of. Thank you very much, Uncle Oliver. Sorry about that. So I want to show you this, Dr. Dr. Bill. Let's talk about security. Let's talk about what is happening, right? Okay. Now, let's, let, me, let me show you this. This is a computer. Let's take that. This is one computer here. This is one. And we have another thing. This is this. This is a cloud environment. Uh, let me give you another computer here. One and give you two computers there. Then I give you another computer here. You see, sorry about the diagram, it's just to explain something to you so that you can understand. And uh, let's have something like other two computers over here. One and we have uh, this one. 
let's just say this another computer here okay now let's take this that oops one second oh yeah this one no what size is this okay this is what when when our ceo comes and talk to us this is what i'm visualizing i'm visualizing that oops yeah we have something like this this is our network over here the cloud and we go here this is another thing then this one leads to here this one comes and goes here and there is something that oops something comes here and goes to this one okay let's say oops let's say we have we have our oops, oops okay let's say this is this this blocks that i'm drawing here let's call them our our security okay so this is like firewall so we'll call them firewall okay so let's say we have a firewall this uh what's okay yeah, boom so we have firewall number 1 firewall 1 and we have on on here we have firewall 2 and over here this is the internet right here internet and over here we have let's say we have uh um client one client client one it can be any kind of that client can be any kind of it can be, be any kind of services and we have client two and uh, we have let's say client three right here Okay, now if we look at it, and uh, we have this is the main server, right? This is the host. Okay, for instance, let's say this our host is hosting. It has a host. It's hosting our websites. Let's say it's web hosting our websites. It has firewall. Okay, firewall number one and firewall number two. So along here, along here, this area. Oops. This area, yeah, let me leave that there. And take it again. Why is it coming here? Okay, let me take it again. Around here, will we call this place a different name. And this area that has a lot of security there, we'll call it a name. And the name, we'll call it a DMZ, a demilitarized zone. So, that means this is DMZ, DMZ or demilitarized zone. D, oh, demilitarized, demilitarized zone, zone. So, which is telling you that we are creating something. I'm visualizing that this is what we are getting in all passage because. When you hear about our security and all of that. So this area, which is red, is a demilitarized zone. We have a host. Um, after that host, immediately after that host, we have a firewall. We have a firewall. The firewall rules now will dictate any incoming and outgoing traffic in that environment. So we have our network, which is the internet. And immediately after that internet, we have another, like, another security, which is the firewall number two, which is also capable of um, addressing or filter the ingoing and outgoing of traffic. Then let's say we have this server number one, it can be a mail server. This client one, mail server, it can be a mail server. Client number two, it can be um, a printer server. Um, let's say client number three can be for file transfer protocol. So if you look at what we're having, it is another layer of security. We have one layer of security, another layer of security, dub like, I mean like real security. Then we bring artificial intelligence ads there again. That's, I mean, too much, that, that's, when he talks, that's why I visualize that that is something that we're trying to, to get at. I don't know if that uh, helps you, Dr. Bill. 
Yeah, let me also let me also add something there, uh, Michael. Thank you on that. Go, um, be, be based, be, uh, yeah, based on that diagram, yes, when, sir. Yeah, based on that diagram, yes, sir. Doctor Bill, our data, the, the data that is being stored, that is being stored in our premise in our cloud data center, is encrypted. It's encrypted. In, they will call that encryption in trans. I mean, encryption at rest, because the data rests within us. So that one is protected. Then now the the transmission of the data is encryption in transit, which is you know which is also protected. So based on this diagram, is we have firewalls, static firewalls and dynamic firewalls. That these are different different layers. So so you you the you you that is your company that you want to come and buy services from us, we will tell you okay. Those employees that you think that they are contractors, those are the ones that are in the DMZ zone, the demilitarized zone. The DMZ zone, they, we, we can store them there. But there will also be firewalls because all the data comes from the internet. You don't trust anything that comes from the internet. So whatever thing that comes from the internet has to be protected also. So but the data that is going to be with us in our prem, in, in our, in our that, that will reside with us is going to be encrypted. It's going to be encrypted. You cannot you cannot even penetrate it because they will, because they are going to be like like, like I said before that they will, they, 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 there's going to be a penetration test like I mean, I mean, my brother my Madi Degamo said this department our CEO has hired somebody that is going to be hacking the system and protecting it that is which is mm -hmm. penetration test but I just want to understand that we are going to protect your data that is on our environment by encrypting all those data. That we don't, we are not going to have access to it. You are you, the company, you're going to have access to it. And we are going to have extra layers of firewalls, like the dynamic and the, the dynamic and the static firewalls. So people, nobody can penetrate in, in it. We cannot swear 100 percent but it can come from your internal employees because they have access to it, they can get into it. That's why I said for extra security, we give um we advise vendors or companies to like give privileges so that if you don't, if you don't have anything to do with a, some particular data, they don't give you that permission to, to, to work on this data. Hey, thank I think, you. I think, I think that is clear. Yeah, it's very good. You know, I, I think that those explanations help a lot of people, but I think that that diagram, maybe uh, you should keep it for an NSC. <laughs> you might make some money on that diagram. Non-fungible. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else for um, hey Lynn, Dr. Yeah, like, Dr. I'd Bill? Like, I'd like to add something too, really quick. Um, like Oliver and everybody's talking about security. I don't know if people know, but not one person in India knows everything. Not one person knows it all. And that's on purpose. People who know, know. The people who know how to connect, connect. And they're two separate things. So even that far, they've gone into security. So, yeah, it's a big, big, big deal. And I know you get these IT guys in here. You got to you gotta dumb it down a little bit so we don't get slapped around. But, you know, and you talk about data center. For us idiots like me, if you look at it like there's highways, right? You have highways, you have internet highways, and there's toll booths. We will own the toll booths. So you can't drive on the highway unless you have the toll booths, and we will be collecting the money because we own the toll booths, and they will maintain their own highways. So to make it really simple, from my mind, that, you know, there's other ways to look at it, but security-wise is a big, big, super big deal. If you're not secure, don't even build this company. It, it doesn't make sense. So they, they're very secure for sure. Thank you, Marty. Appreciate it. We have Bruce Gersky. Hi, Bruce. You can unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Happy belated birthday again, Marty. I want to thank Aline and Ron for putting this on and Marty hosting. And I want to thank Oliver and Michael for everything they've done for us tonight. You know, like Lynn, I'm pretty much an illiterate when it comes to, uh, well, she's a lot better than me, 
but technically I'm an idiot. And one of the things we always said about on passive is that even an idiot can succeed here. Most people don't understand a lot of this stuff. So when it comes to technology, but one thing I remember from the beginning, as I've always said, everything has to be secure. Everything has to be secure. It was tenth month and what he said. In priority, things are for founders only, so that so that people can't get in here and muck up the works. But uh, aside from that, I have great faith in and Nash and everything he does. And the ins and out of how do we get secure and all that doesn't matter to me. I just know that Ash is going to make sure we're secure. And you can rest assured with that if anybody has a question on that. My question to Michael and Oliver was, uh, you know, there are a lot of billion dollar companies, like Michael has said, that spend thousands and millions of dollars on on uh, the cloud every every year. So let's say someone decided, you know, I'm going to take it, send $97 and get into this little obscure company because it sounds like they may have something they can use. And they could use everything, like, like Bill said in his magnanimous way, this is a one-stop shop. So if somebody comes in and has billions of dollars or comes in for $97 and spends the 200 to 300 whatever it may be, to get the one-stop shop. When it comes to the, the databases that they have that, that, that they want to transfer over to here, uh, are they going to have to be more than the 250 for that? want think, to take that i think that question um, um the ceo will answer that question when it comes to the payment and the savings well, maybe um uh, maddie should you have on that when it comes to payment and how they're going to put the bundles to pay for the um uh, for for the transmission of the data just i i, I don't know maybe the ceo might might have an idea on that but i know it's i know they pay my company we pay one million dollar to transmit data from our data center to AWS, we pay a million dollar. This is this is just for the transmission of the data. This is not talking about how well as it's going to be there because it was it's, um, uh, a SaaS, which is a software as a service. You know, which therefore they are going to take the responsibility to handle all to protect the data, pen tests, firewalls, everything. They they will take responsibility. This that that was that was different, and that is how we are also going to make money. The transmission of the data, the cost to transmit those data, and a monthly payment that our data is going to reside in our in uh, in our cloud um, center. But for how much that um um on pass will pay will cost for 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 companies to transmit their data, I don't know. No, I don't. I don't think we know. I I, I do know this: they'll charge less than everybody else. Yeah. That's where the value will come in because they got super wow. value on everything else. Yep. So people will want to come mainly for that reason. The other reason is uh, um, Passive is going to sell itself through being different than any other company, right? We know that. They're going to be upfront, led by heart. People know it. And then what happens is when companies see that, and then all of a sudden you say, oh, by the way, the company that you admire, they now have a data center. Would you like to store your data there and run through us instead of somebody else? It's a done deal. You don't have to sell anything. It's going to happen because they've already sold who they are before they get to that point. So, yeah, everything he, he's doing is strategic. He knows why he's doing it, when he's doing it, how he does it. And you got to go somewhere, right? You have to go somewhere. A lot of people store go to data different areas than, than just one. And, but if you own your own data center, oh my God, and then you use that as part of your revenue service also, and if you can do it efficiently and you can charge less and you can be secure, you're done. It's a done deal. It's not brain surgery. It's uh, 
people are looking for that. People are looking to save. They're looking to get better value. Um, machine learning, no doubt, is it's it's no it's not going anywhere. It's only going to increase every day. Next five years, we we won't even recognize what we have now in five years. So, and because he's thinking ahead, yeah. I mean, there'll, there'll be big big companies probably in a couple of years that will actually post through O data whatever he calls it. Well. So you think that uh, he will have different tiers for people who are coming in with huge databases to come in? Well, I mean, it all has to do with su supply and demand. I am not an expert, but if I'm a medium-sized business, I don't need as much data to be stored. But if I'm, a, if I'm an unpassive, for example, that's huge. I mean, he's going to, you know, just for O founder, not, I mean, Go founder site was 30 grand a month just to host that one site. And this is much bigger than that. This will be, you know, that's why now you, you hear about the migration. Everybody goes, well, I've got this. I don't. I got this. I don't. I got this, but I don't. You're not being left out. A lot of it is it takes that much time to process data across the world. But when you start to own these centers and you control the in and the out and how much you have, I mean, it's it's a very powerful thing. It's uh, you own your own city, you own the the universe that you live in. It's pretty cool stuff. Well, it's starting to feel like we're going to have the keys to the kingdom. Well, the kingdom will be ours. That's the thing, yep. right? I mean, the kingdom will be ours. Yep. And you don't have to rely on somebody else. I mean, a data center can actually shut you down. They could say one reason they did it, but they can have any reason to shut you down. Yep. And, and if you're big and you rely on them, especially a big data center like AWS or something, Esson, Esson or something, which is the biggest, I think. But anyway, you if you're relying on them and they decide to, whatever they decide, man, I mean, you're hurting. And you can't afford to go down one second, not one second. So that, that's why it's important for us to have our own centers before they know what we're doing. Yeah, I, I just, you know, everybody's worried about other companies coming after us. Remember one thing very important. If you looked at business as boxing, we're entering the ring as Mike Tyson when he was 20 years old. We're not entering the ring like some scrawny kid. I mean, we're coming in as a unicorn company. We were born a unicorn. Nobody can say that. We, they brag about co companies that took 20 years to make a billion dollars. We're gonna enter the ring as one of the big boys on the block. They're not gonna push us around. They're gonna work with us or they can, they're gonna have problems. Ash never says competition. He doesn't even say it. Yeah, I know. We're gonna go there, we're gonna, we're gonna Offer value. If you have value, competition doesn't matter, right? Because I don't think we have any competition. Zero. Zero, zero. People got to think about what's being said. There is no competition. Name any product we have and think of the price and think of the value. It's a done deal. That's why he doesn't say it. He's not out to get anybody. He's not out to destroy anybody. He's going to lay the buffet on the table. And whoever wants to come and eat is going to come and eat. Trust me, there's going to be a lot of people eating, a lot. Big companies, big, big companies. That I think they're probably already knocking on the door. They see what's coming. Yeah, I mean, you don't enter, you don't enter the big boys' lead and not be ready. We're entering big. We're not entering as a small company. We are top dog. We're highly trained, and we can knock out with one punch. You don't have to, but we could. So that's what he's building a foundation with. Big legs and a strong core. <laughs> so you can uh, go to the fight if you have to. Take that to the bank. Thanks, Thank Marty. Thanks, Marty. Thank you, Bruce. You're welcome. Next, we have Tony Monk. You can unmute. Thank you, Lynn. I think we're more like a decacorn company, Marty, which is going to be the 10 billion plus a year. Um, I remember, I remember something that Ash has been saying for the past few years, and that's we're going to be the hunted. 
we are going to be the hunted. In other words, we have everything that we need. People are going to want, and they're going to be coming to us. Uh, another another question that I have. Okay, so we we as founding members, we understand the concept of the business. We know it's an automated system. We understand the products that we have. Uh, we're learning all the time. But uh, this 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 question is for Oliver and Marty and Mike. And thank you, Mike, by the way, for uh, putting that uh, structure together, showing us the security. That was really cool the way you did that. Um, okay, so we understand the concept. Now we're going to own a data center. Okay, a data center is huge. Now let's talk about uh, 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 the revenue part of it. Uh, the apples. What kind of apples are we looking at uh, as founding members with our own data center? Can somebody explain that, Oliver? Man, it's huge. It's huge. Just, just, just look at um, Amazon. Amazon is a distribution company. But when they, but when Jeff Bezos came in with um, their own cloud service, they bump up. The graph just pop up. So, and the different avenue for us to make money with our data center, like we just talked about migration. We talk about um, the services that we're going to provide that your data is going to recite or be stored on our prems. You know, we talk. I will follow, I've talked about the service and the software as a service, uh, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. So all those services that we are going to provide, the security that we are going to provide, there are a lot of avenues that we are going to make money. For me to sit there and stock the, the, the exact amount, I think I'm going to show some numbers from between now. 2022 and 2025, 940 something billion dollar. Just imagine how much on passive is going to take from that from that from that 940 something billion dollar. You know, it's going to be huge. I can't really put it a, 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 an exact figure on how much we are going to make, but I know, like uh, my brother Madi just said, we are going to be the big dog, and we are getting into the boxing ring, like super like um, Mike Tyson when he was 20 years old. And uh, we are going to sweep the market. That I will say that authoritatively because I've been in the industry for long. So I know what, when Ash talk, I listen to him. I know what, I know what is coming. And um, knowing what the other people, remember that we're also going to have third party that are going to work with us. And they, will be, and they are going to make billions of dollars also. Because I know a lot of other companies that are third party to um, Amazon, they are, they are multi-billion dollar industry. I can, one is Snowflake. If anybody can, can go Google Snowflake, I think that three point something billion dollar industry. But they are, but they are third party. They store, they, they, they'll come to you, get the data, go store it to, to, to Amazon. So um, we are going to be the big dog and uh, for, for the exact amount of money, but I know we are going to have a, a large junk from that 900 and some, 940 something billion dollar. I know that very well, because our okay. services, our services, like um, Mamadi just said, our prices is going to be down affordable. You come and buy our products. We have for less than no cost, no licenses, you know, unlimited. Then, then the price that you, that, that on passive will say, okay, you will store your data here on this price. Then when you compare it with, with where you are now, where the companies are now, every CEO wants to want to save money. And all the CEOs they want to save money, and like I said, most of the CEO will refer on passive to their other CEOs because of our cost, because of our price, the unlimited our services for for you know for less than what they are paying, you know. Maybe maybe Madi will have something to yeah, add on that. You. Thank you, brother. Oh, I, I don't think you could put a, a, a price, but if you keep building a bigger and bigger net, you're going to catch more fish. Mm. And as we far as building a huge net that's going to engulf the whole world, you're when you reel that pig in, you're about to have some fish on it. Okay, and and it's just he's not going for one thing; he's going for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different small things that people either want or need. Want or need, want or need, and he's following all of it. And when you say about the hunt and the hunted, he said that we're gonna be the hunted. He said that a couple of years ago and, and I didn't get it. 
I got it, but I didn't get it. And as we were going on and on and on, I, I started to realize what that means. When you're when the bell curve reaches that you have more cu customers in your group, whatever it might be, whatever we're doing, whether it's data center or the products or whatever we're doing, uh, digital products or handheld product, whatever, when it gets to like a, a Facebook size scale where you're talking a billion people in, in your group or over a billion, you become the hunted. Why? Because where do people go to sell their goods and services? They go to consumers. If the consumers are in your atmosphere, which would be on passive, you become the hunted. Whatever, you don't have to go advertise anymore. The day will come that advertising will be finished for on passive. I know everybody's thinking that's impossible. No, it's not. Who does Facebook advertise to? Let me know. No one. They don't have to because the consumer is in their backyard. The day will come when that bell curve hits where we've got somebody in on passive for something. I don't care what it is. When you hit that number and it goes over that curve, now it's no longer are you marketing to get people or people are coming to you to market what they have. Right. That's right. going to come. Now, when that comes, you become the, the lion, not the gazelle. Right. And, and Marty, and, just and this that's, co that's coming. I don't even, nobody knows how quick. That's about as technical as I can get, Tony. Okay. So <laughs> I have a question quick. for you. I have another question for you, Marty. This one is specifically for you. And I've answered this question many times. There's a lot of there's a lot of founding members that have this confused uh, about the share, about the share, about the profit sharing of the company. Uh, what is the difference? And, and I've answered this question many times, but I wanted to hear your perspective from this. What is the difference between shareholders and founding members? Mm. Oh, man. A shareholder can buy a percentage of shares of the total part of the, the okay, there's 100% 100, 100 of the company and I own 20% of the company. Okay, I own 20% of the company. We're not shareholders. We're founders. The difference is the bigger the company gets, like right now we're a million people, a million, 100,000, whatever. In a year's time, we'll be less than what? 1% of the company maybe? And in and, and five years, maybe less than one-tenth of 1%. So all the revenue that comes in is still going to that small percentage of people. Yes, we're going to have resellers and all that. And trust me, resellers are going to come in here and make tens of millions of dollars tens of millions of dollars because they know how to market. Is it going to hurt you? No, because they're going to be in your downline for the first time in the history of mankind. The other thing is other companies are going to come here and work with Unpassive, not against them. We will help other companies make millions and millions of dollars. Listen, if I was an MLM company and while I'm starting, starting up my company, my tools my tools and my ML, uh, ML, ML company would be on passive. So as I brought people in, I would tie them into on passive. That's part of the deal. That is your package. Why? Because they do the other part that people can't do. So you're successful. They're successful. So this is a big ride. This is a, this is huge. This is absolutely database. Yeah. Database is huge. How do you know? 52% of Amazon's revenue is from a database that they came up with, what, 10 years ago, something like that. It's it's 52%. It, it has actually crossed over 50-50. It's now higher than what they make selling and delivering products. Do you think they're making a lot of money? Yes. Do they say how much they're going to make? Yes. Why? Because there's nobody on the same street with them at, at what they do. Now, there's different servers that handle different types of things. But if Unpassive comes along and says, wait a minute, we're going to do what you're doing, but we're going to charge 50% less. I'm exaggerating, but whatever it is, companies want to cut costs, guys. Everybody knows that. That's where you get your value at. So while you're cutting costs and you're throwing this big net, you're catching people that want to do this, 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 everybody picks what they want. 99% of the people that come in on Passive will be customers. Customers, everybody thinks, oh, what are we going to do with all these founders? We're one-tenth of one percent in five years, probably, if we're lucky. 
But this is big. I mean, we got people all over the world. And remember, 4.6 billion people have the internet now. When we send up five or six rockets with a bunch of satellite, now we have set eight, five billion people that are on the internet. Where are they going? They're going down past. Eventually, if you build it right now, they will come. And that's what he's doing. And it's about all these little things. It's little pieces. You watch Ash when he talks. That's why when he talks, when I first got in, it's going to be three years. I used to think, what the frick is he talking about, right? So we'd get together, and, and I, I think he meant this. I think he meant that. And you put this little puzzle together. And when you're done, you go, I think that's a farm field. I think that's a cow. And I think that's a son. Okay, it's a farm. And if you're lucky, you're right. But if you really listen to what he's saying, he does paint a, a picture every time he's on. He paints a picture. Where people make a mistake and say, go in and say, I want to hear this. Don't do that. Go in there and say, what am I going to hear? Because he drops things constantly. Constantly. I see people in there with a face like, uh, what's the big deal? And I'm thinking, holy cow, that was big news, right? When he first brought up the data center, most people didn't know what that meant. I don't know. I looked it up right away. I'm a Google maniac, right? So what the frick, you know, and you find out. So no, we're in for a ride of a lifetime and we haven't seen nothing. And because, well, because he's constantly looking ahead, I mean, he's talking about manufacturing things, physical products. He's already talking about that. He knows what it costs to put satellites in space so people in Papua New Guinea don't have to climb a tree to get the internet. No, I mean, there's a lot of stuff coming and it's only going to get more and more and more and more and more. We're very fortunate. I didn't mean to talk this much. Plus, I never raised my hand. Lynn, you should kick me off. Marty, that was amazingly articulated. I loved it. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Lynn. You're quite welcome, Tony. Thank you for asking that. I learned a lot, too. It's awesome. Next, we have William. William Delorme from Canada. You can unmute yourself. Hi, Lynn. Hello, Marty. Uh, I like to say I really enjoying this because you're going from fiber optics to security. And what I'm hearing is that you really care about the little guy because They've made a business out of hacking and security is another big business. So, so they are not going to, that's what Ash Marfari said, that they're not going to like on passive because we are the correction to the corruption. So we get rid of all that. <clears throat> because there's a pandemic around. We know that people are losing jobs and these people are allowed to go into their funding and take their money. That's horrible. These people deserve to go on another planet. That's what I have to say about those people. <laughs> and we're going to see that. And can you imagine us stopping these people and they think they're more smarter than we are, that on passive, they are not going to like us because we're going to be the correction. That's how smart we are. I'll give Thanks. that to Marty because that's a question that has to be dealt with. Thank you, William. Appreciate it. I think that's it. I that it for hands. Are we good? Everybody got your questions answered? Everyone good? All right. Well, this is about the right time to end. We're a little bit over, but that's fine because I think we all gained a lot. Every minute of this a webinar was great. This time, oh. then. Who is that speaking? It's me, Betty Nunn. Can I please say one more thing to Marty? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. 
Marty, I just want to say happiest, happiest birthday to you. And I bet Shoy is so proud of you. I remember when we were co-founders and we saw Shorty. That's it, Lynn. Thank Love you. Love you. All right. All right. So at this time, it's my time mm -hmm. to give thanks to the people who have contributed to this webinar. And I think it was, I thought it was extra special. I, I personally gained a lot. Um, te technical stuff is not my thing, but I got quite a bit out of the presentations. The screen shares were very helpful as well. And we hope to continue along this line as I believe there's lots of learning that we need to do. You know, especially being in an AI company like this, it, it pays off to just learn as much as we can, although you don't have to know a thing, but why not, right? So when, right now I'd like to thank the people that have made this webinar what it is today. First of all, before I forget, I'm thanking you, all the attendees here, because without you, we would not have Friday Night Live. So I appreciate you and I love each and every one of you. Thank you to my co-host, Ron Hulbert. You know, he's not feeling well, he has some health issues, so please keep him in your prayers because I need him. He's my co-host. He's special. He's precious to me. So please pray for him. Send him your good thoughts and hope he can just get better so he can be with us every Friday. Thank you to Marty, who is always gracious in letting us use his uh, the corporate webinar. We're able to use Ashma Farah's corporate webinar. We're blessed because we can have as many attendees as we want. And one day, oh, we're gonna have more than 20,000, but I just forgot. We're gonna have O Connect by then. So we won't have any limits. So we can have as many participants as we want. So that's a great thing. Thank you to Kevin Rutledge, who faithfully does our graphics. The pretty graphics that you see, we appreciate him. Sometimes I'm last minute, and asking him to help me make the graphic and he never complains. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you to Julie Wynn. You know, sometimes she's quiet, like now she's quiet, but guess what? She's here. She's here with us, her heart and her soul and her, she's here with me, you know, and I feel her support. So thank you, love you so much, Julie. Thank you to Chris Johnson, our hey, hey, hey man. He's always here. He, he's the guy that I could count on to post Friday night live in the back office, no matter what the time. He's always there and he makes it for us. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you to our presenters, engineer Mike Ojantambia. Did you like what he said? Did you guys learn from him? Let's give him a hand. Thank you to Oliver Fonte, who also contributed an immense amount of information for, for us. Thank you, Oliver. You did a great job. Thank you to the leaders here in the house that were here. We had Dr. Bill Williams. We had Cindy Hopkins here. David Bacow is here. He got, he had to leave, but he's back in the panelist list. We have Viviana Rodriguez. Hi, Viviana. She's, on, she's here very frequently. Appreciate you so much. And thank you to Jeffrey Morlock as well. Did I miss anybody? Hope I didn't miss any leaders. The leadership council. I think I got them all. So thank hey, you Lynn, so much. Yes. You know, a little bit ago when Marty was talking, he brought something up. Can I give you a Ash quote? Yes, certainly. We should all probably remember this, Marty. You reminded me of it. This is quote quoting Ash. We're starting much stronger than other companies like Google, etc. Our staff has come from companies like J.P. Morgan, Apple, Wells Fargo, etc. Like Google at its beginning, on passive is a movement and we too will become a global leader. In this way, we will be way above the crowd. That was from 2019 when he was still unfolding the vision. Powerful, powerful quote. Uh, Thank you Lynn, so much. Lynn, Lynn uh, yes. Bill, yes. Bill, Bill Williams as well. We forgot about him, I think. Oh, I said Dr. Bill Williams. Oh, you did. I'm sorry. It's me then. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. No, the reminder is welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a great ending, Jeffrey. I think very apt saying from Ash. He's a very wise man. And he knew what was going to happen back in 2019, didn't he? Maybe we didn't know, but he knew. So thank you, everybody, for being here.
Let's go ahead and unmute. Don't forget to come next week, Friday, okay? See you back here on Friday Night Live. Same time, same webinar link. Now you can unmute and say aloha to each other. Bye. Well, they're not a quiet bunch. Bye. Good night, Happy everybody. Happy oh, birthday, yeah. Marty. I missed it. Happy birthday. Thank you for all the presenters. Good night, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Good. Good. Thank good you so much for the data center. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank, you for the training. Thank you for the information. Very good much. Thank you so much. Engineer yeah. Mike. Yeah. I Thank you for the data. Thank you for the penetration testing. Bye-bye. Good night.